Hi everybody, my name is Jonathan Ross. Um, I'm actually an instructor at the local community college, which is AB Tech here in Asheville. Um, I teach digital media, which it means I teach a lot of different things like animation, multimedia, video production, graphic design, and some web development. I am also a freelance web developer, designer, front-end developer is really the proper term to use. And I'll be the first one to tell you that I don't know that much about PHP at all. I really am not a programmer. I'm a front-end developer. It's a big difference. And so what we're going to be talking about today is building themes in WordPress. So we kind of have to also talk about how WordPress works, like how, what are the different pieces of WordPress that you're working with when you develop themes. So Everybody knows that you can go out and buy themes, right? You can buy these extremely fancy, beautiful themes. And if you start to look into them, they're really quite attractive when you look at the fact that they're fully responsive. You know, this one says it, it installs really easily. It's got 100 plus theme options. Woohoo! That's 100 opportunities for you to not know at all what you're doing, right? <laughs> And then you have short codes. And what the heck are short codes? And SEO friendly, which is great, and PSDs, if you guys are Photoshop people, awesome. Now, I challenge you, go in, mock up, take their mock up the Photoshop document, make it exactly the way you want it, and then try and make their theme fit that. It's going to be fun, right? So I've used this one. This one's really kind of cool. It's called Infold. And it's one of the really fancy ones out there. Somebody was talking about Divi as well today. And these things are beautiful. I really admit I cannot do what the designers that created these things can do. I really can't. To make parallax and full screen images and stuff, of course I can do it, but I do it by brute force. And I do it by lots of research, finding the right code, troubleshooting that code, trying it without putting it into WordPress first, and then putting it into WordPress. And then it works the way I expect it to work, which is wonderful, instead of me using this thing. And then, of course, what happens is you put in the slider just the way it is built into Enfold, and what does your client do? They say, you know, would you, you think it'd be possible to add a little arrow at the bottom, or maybe I, I saw this other slider on this other website. Can we use that slider instead? And, and I don't really like the way that the three boxes work. Can we put a picture up on top of them instead? And you're like, no, I can't because this is what I'm dealing with. And I know you guys can't see that code, but, but this is the actual infold index page code that's there. And if you look at this thing, it's got filters for, oh, I don't even know what this stuff is. The Avia Builder L no sibling paginate Ah! And to go figure out where to change that in the code is really complicated. So me being somebody who feels as though you should develop all of your themes from scratch. And once again, I go back to me being an educator. And the reason I say that is because um, I have a real problem with people using themes, not because you cannot do amazingly beautiful websites with themes, but I'm an educator and I feel like you got to learn how to do it yourself. And then you could go evaluate whether or not a theme is the right choice. But being able to do it yourself is kind of like my mission. And of course, my mission in classes. So, you know, sometimes to understand how themes work, you feel like you have to be a mathematician and be able to do all this complicated stuff. However, here's the problem for us. And that is, there is a shift for us as designers. It used to be that you were a front-end designer, right? You're no longer a front-end designer. You're now a front-end developer, which means that you have to do a little bit of code. You don't have to be amazing. You don't have to be like um, your friend Laurel. Is that? Yeah. Laurel is the coder, and then Nick is a designer. They were just talking about it. And if you were at the um, Status Forward um, presentation that was before this, this presentation is a perfect follow-up to that particular one because we're going to kind of look at some of the building blocks of WordPress. But nowadays, we see this amalgamation of the two roles, of developer and designer, and they call it a front-end developer. And so the thing is, you can get scared when you go, oh my gosh, I have to learn code. I'll be the first one to tell you, 
I know about three PHP tags. Echo, or no, PHP info. That's about all I know, and echo some code. Other than that, I copy and paste code that I find online, and I modify it as I need, and then I've kind of built a little library of things that I do over and over. And I go, wow, if that works once, I probably can make it work another time. So let's first look at what is the difference between a template versus a theme. If you look at WordPress, you really don't need that much to actually make a fully functioning content management system. This is all you need. These three files over here, index, screenshot, and style CSS. In fact, you only need two of those files. If you look at a theme, it's a collection of a whole bunch of files, and we'll talk about what those files do in a minute. So your simplest template requires three files total. It requires two files, but the, the screenshot is just so that it comes up and you can see you know, something visual that shows you what theme that you're, you've chosen. That's really not too complicated. The first file you need is the style CSS file. Now, we're not typical. We typically, as designers, don't go in and put a whole bunch of comments in our CSS. But this is one thing that WordPress requires. At the top of your CSS file, this is your style.css file, you have some information that describes what this theme is, including what the name of the theme is, description, author, um, and actually the only thing you actually have to have is the name of the theme, because it needs to know which theme is currently the one that's being used, that's installed, and it uses the name that's up there to be able to uh, show you that in WordPress. You don't actually have to have the name match the folder, which is pretty good. Some other content management systems, if you had the name not match the folder name, then everything would break and it wouldn't install. But you have to have this information at the top of the CSS file in order to install that theme. So that's the first thing. The next thing that we need is a simple HTML template with a few little um, PHP tags here. Now, you guys probably recognize this, right? Everybody here knows basic HTML, hopefully? OK. <clears throat> so at the top of the page, we have the document, our head section, and then we have our body section, we have an article, we have our navigation. Now, all we have to do is add in a few little template tags for WordPress, and we have a fully functioning content management system. The first one we have is WP Head. And what that does is say, let's load all the stuff that WordPress says that we're required to load in the head section of our document. The next thing we have is loading our style sheet. Now, you don't actually have to load your style sheet, but it sure does look more attractive when you actually have some styles to your website, of course. Um, so that's the next thing. The next thing after that would be this, a menu. And we're doing just the simplest tag there, um, WP menu, uh, nav menu. And it says, load a dynamically generated menu. That way it's not static, but it changes as we change things in WordPress. The next thing we have is what's called the loop. Is everybody familiar with the loop? OK, we'll talk more about it. Um, but understanding the loop is very, very important. And then the last thing is the WP footer. With this code right here, we can have a fully functioning content management system in WordPress. Does that seem too complicated? Not really. How many people have done WordPress websites without like blogs and all that kind of stuff? And without commenting? Then this right here will do just fine. It doesn't have any comments. It doesn't have blog posts. Well, you can have blog posts, but it doesn't have to have them. Now, it has very little other things added, but we'll look at some of those building blocks as we go forward. So once again, this is all we have. We have WP head at the top. We have our style sheet. We have a menu. We have the page content that's done through a loop. And we have the footer. And the footer, by the way, is required because sometimes JavaScript, um, especially when you use plugins, Plugins will use both the header and the footer, and they'll inject some things at the top, like CSS at the top, and then they'll inject some JavaScript, jQuery, or something like that at the bottom. 
for example, um, WordPress uses it when you log in and you have the admin menu and you guys see that big black menu at the top. If you don't have that WP footer, then that can't load. So it's very important that you have those um, on the two sides. So we have required code, style sheets, navigation, content, and then the required code at the bottom. That's pretty much it. Now, that doesn't take you too far because you start to look at trying to make fancier um, projects where you have post pages, and you have a static page, and then you have a page for something else, and you want a page for just when you come to um, a particular type of post, like the news post. And so we get into what's called the template hierarchy. And the template hierarchy is why we have all these different pages. Or that's why we have all these files in a theme. Because each of these themes um, uses, or each of these files, are used by the template hierarchy, the theme hierarchy, to determine which page or file is loading when it's required. So the first thing is understanding that a lot of these things have all these multiple pages or multiple files and that only each file sometimes has only a very small part. For example, the header.php will have just the stuff that goes into the head and the footer will have only the stuff that goes into the footer. And typically those are going to be the same for pretty much every page of the entire website, right? So every page that uses those will be the same. So if you want to change something in the header, it changes for the entire website. This is a wonderful, you know, method of working. Um, it reduces duplicate code and all sorts of stuff. There's a fancy term for it, which is, I should know. I want to say encapsulation, but that's not really the right term for those of you who are real programmers. Huh? Yeah, what, what's the right term for having code only one time? Don't repeat? Okay. That sounds good to me. Dry. So it's the dry method. Um, okay. So some of these other files in here like comments or archive 404, um, let's see, sidebar, single, these are going to be used at certain times depending upon the template hierarchy. Now, if you look at the documentation, it says this is how you should include files, especially the header, the sidebar, and the footer. I'm going to tell you that's not the right way to do it, and the reason why is this amazing plugin called What the File. If you are starting to get into WordPress theme development, it's difficult to figure out which file is being used at the right time until you've kind of learned the hierarchy. And even after you've been doing it, you add one other file in, you're like, whoa, what's it doing now? It's kind of cool. This right here, this plugin, really does help you figure out that stuff. And it requires, and here's what it does, basically. This is um, from last year. And you can see what the file in the top right, and what it's showing me is that I'm on my custom page, and it's showing me all the different template parts that are loaded into this. Then I can go to that one individual um, piece, and all I have to do is click on sidebar.php, and it will automatically um, open that particular file in the editor so that I can make the change I need. So what the file requires get template part instead of get header, get footer. So just one little tiny thing. Now, these are some of the different types of files that you might see in the theme. Front page, home page, page about, page our mission, single, single news, archive, and finally you get down to index. Do you guys know about the template hierarchy? Have you guys heard about this? So this is one of the big fundamental things about how WordPress works. Because what, it, what happens is, as soon as you go to load a WordPress page, it says, what kind of page are you on? Are you on the front page? And if you're on the front page, and it finds a file called frontpage.php, then it will use that page to load the website. It will look at what the structure of that, that particular PHP file is. If that file does not exist, then it will go to the next page that it would use, in this case, index. Now, if you were going to come in and you were um, using a series of posts, and your posts were called news, 
That could also be an ID, and the ID would be five. Let's say that we had one called category, and the slug right here was if we had category dash news, and I went to a page that was news post, then it would use that file. But if that didn't exist, and it did have something called category dash five, because the ID of the post was five, if this makes sense, then it would use that. But if it didn't have that, and it had a page just called category, then it would use that. And if it didn't have that, then it would use one called archive. And if it didn't have that, then it would use index. <laughs> now you can see this gets a little con you know, complicated, right? But you don't really have to use all these. I use maybe, no, oh, 10 files, 8 to 10 files, pretty much in any theme that I've ever built because they really don't have to use, you don't have to have 50 files to be able to have a very successful and complicated custom theme. So the new documentation, if you look at it, is actually a little bit more complicated, but what I love about this graphic, and the reason I have the other one is because you can't really read this one from where you are at all. Um, what I love about this graphic is that it does show you there, it does show you a little bit more about like all the different pages that would default to this page if those other pages didn't exist. So the information graphics side of it is a little bit more accurate. So once again, you can create a very successful content management based or WordPress based website using one file, index.php. All the other files that are here are all if you need to use them. They're not required. That's the beauty of this system. It only uses the file file exists. And if it doesn't exist, then it uses whatever would be the other higher hierarchy, or actually lower hierarchy file. So once again, this is the front page. That would be the home page of the website. Home would be the main posts page. Page would be any page that you've created, like an actual page versus post, which we'll talk about in a second. Then what if you had a page called About or a page called Our Missions? And by the way, if you have two words that are a page name, then it just puts a dash in between it. So I just wanted to show that. Then we have Single for a single post, like you want to go to one news item. Um, and then we have Archive, and we have this, the custom page name because uh, I wanted to have one place where I created just a custom template. Custom templates are extremely easy. You just create any file like any other um, file in, your, um, in the CMS, and you just put this little tiny tag at the top, and you give it a template name. Once you've done that, WordPress will automatically detect it, and then when you go into a page editor, you'll see the properties over there that say, would you like to choose a template? And that template name will show up only because you defined it at the top of the page. It's really very easy to do. And then you can use that particular template for any page, and it will override anything else that it would have automatically chosen. So we're going to get into some of the com common functions that you'll see as you start to develop WordPress themes. We are not going to get into many of them because there's just too many to cover, of course. But it's all about recognizing what they are and kind of what they do, and we'll kind of give you a hint about that. So one of the most common that you're going to see is this. It's called blog info. Do you guys know what this is called? Like, what's the, what that would be called in WordPress? Is it a function? Is it a hook? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question, too, because if we know what to call it, then we know how to look for it, right? So it's really called a hook, and we'll talk about that in a second. But even looking at this, this is just a simple head section of a website. We'll notice that we have blog info character set. And so do, how many of you do PHP, basics of PHP? So the others of you need to learn a little PHP, but it's not too difficult. Because if we look, we look at this right here, this is a PHP function or a hook in WordPress. And right here in the middle, you can put what's called an argument, which says, well, 
I want a name, but am I talking about the first name or the last name or the middle name? So I could say, I want name, first name, and I'd put it in the middle there. So with this blog info, I can do blog info character set. I can do blog info name, and that's the name of the website as it's been put in WordPress. And then I can do this, blog info style sheet URL. And then another one is blog info template URL. And all these things are automatically generated by WordPress. You just have to know, hey, I need to find out what the URL of this theme is. And so blog info is one of those that you'll find yourself going to all the time because it's so incredibly useful. Another thing that you'll have to do is use navigation. And there are a, two main ways to do navigation, a nav menu and list pages. So the first one, WP nav menu, can be just like it is. Have you guys all used menus where you create a menu yourself in WordPress and you do it over on the left-hand side and you can add pages and resort them however you want, right? So that's what nav menu uses. In fact, you know that you can create multiple menus, right? And so right here, you can just say, I'd like to use the menu main, na ma main nav versus footer nav or side nav or whatever else what other menu you've created. Now you can even output that menu in a certain way, like I can output the submenu with sorting it using the menu order, or maybe I could sort it alphabetically or however I want to sort it. Um, of course, if you sort it differently than you see it when you create it, that could be a little confusing. I would probably not tell you to, to output your menu in a different order than the order that you've created it. Um, but then you can also output the container class for CSS. And I could say, I want to use the sub nav, and I want to have a class around it so it says sub menu. So that I'm actually able to uh, make it output the way I want it to. So the, the WP nav menu uses the menus that you've set up in the sidebar in WordPress. The other one that you have is WP list pages. And this one is all about you creating pages. And it doesn't matter if you've created a menu for them because it'll just go through and find all the pages that you've created and then output them the way that you want. And you can output them with uh, the sort um, using the um, menu order and the depth is one which basically says do all of them. Um, and then the list title or the title li here says nothing. I'm not going to go into what they are, just going to say that what you're doing is you're taking this, this core function called list pages, and then you're able to add options to it, which are called arguments. And that's really important when you're getting into WordPress because this is where all the magic happens. It's you making decisions about what tag you want to use, and then how you want to alter it, how it works by default. So the other one that you would use for navigation quite a lot is this, the permalink. And the permalink is really essential if you have like a post that you want to be able to link to where that post is. And that permalink is what travels with every single piece of content that you create you know, whether it's a post or a page. They all have a permalink that goes directly to that page or to that post. So that's another navigation element. That's three tags total that you have to be able to use to be able to navigate to any page on your website. That's not too complicated, right? Now, things get a little bit more interesting when you get into this file called the functions.php file. Because if you want to do anything fancier beyond like the simple template, which has the navigation and the page content, like you want to be able to have widgets or featured images, which you guys have heard of, I'm sure, then you have to get into using this file. It doesn't have to be complicated, but it has to be there. So the functions PHP file helps you do things like enabling and creating widgets, enabling and creating post thumbnails, altering the default WordPress hooks functions, like that blog info or get excerpt, 
um, creating custom functions and more, which we're not even going to talk about. So the official term for what these things are called are called hooks. Hooks are that thing like blog info. That's a hook that I guess that they gave it a, a fun title so you can kind of, I guess even with CSS, they're called hooks too, the official title for when you have class equals header. That's actually called a hook officially. So hooks in WordPress come in two different types, actions and filters. So we have an action called get excerpt, and then we're able to change the way that get excerpt works by creating a function. And the filters allow me to do things like change the length of that excerpt um, from 150 to 200 um, and modify how that particular hook works. This is something that takes a little bit of getting used to in WordPress, um, but it can be pretty cool. The next thing we have are widgets. And widgets are so that we can create our little sidebar items. So here we've got the widgets, and this is how you might see them used. Here's a sidebar and a footer social. And then these are the available widgets. You guys know that when you do a lot of plugins, they create widgets that you can use. Well, you can't use them at all in your theme until you put this code into your function's PHP file. And that says, register sidebars. Why they call it sidebars here and they call it widgets somewhere else, I don't really understand, but just realize that sidebars are widgets. Now, you have to have this that says, let's create sidebars but it doesn't tell you how many sidebars you have and what those sidebars are called. So in order to do that, we would actually have to register the sidebars and give them names. For example, this one says, I'm gonna do sidebar main, sidebar extra, and this is really cool. This one says, I'm gonna do a module, and I'm gonna do two of them. So we'd do module one and two, because it creates it twice. Kinda cool. Now you can also do more where you register a sidebar and you give it a name and you actually change the output of that sidebar as well. Like whether or not it might have a class before it or a title. A lot of times when you use widgets, they use H3s as titles. Is that correct? And this you can change to an H4 if you prefer H4. So kind of cool. Once you've got those created, then to use them in your template, all you have to do is say, if the function exists, use a dynamic sidebar. Or if you really want to, why don't I output an individual sidebar or an individual widget? And anything that I've put into that widget in WordPress will then be output through my theme once I've done that. So once again, I have to create the widget in my functions file, then I can use it in my template file. Make sense? Um, so if you don't want to go through and do all the code yourself, I did find this awesome website. It's called Generate WP. And this is one of the best resources you can find. What this allows you to do is generate a whole bunch of different things like sidebars. Um, I'm not really sure what happened to the sidebar. There it is, sidebar generator. So I can go to the sidebar generator. I can choose what I want to name my sidebars, how I want to output this stuff, and then I can update the code, and it will give me the code to just copy and paste. I don't have to go into the functions file and start typing things away. It's a lot easier when you use a tool like this because it can get a, a little complicated, but it's not so complicated when you use a tool like this to output the code for you. The next thing we have to use are post thumbnails. Everybody loves using featured images, right? Featured images are one of the foundational awesome things about WordPress. And so in order to enable featured images, like the one that we have over here on the right-hand side, we have to have the support for those added into WordPress. So in the functions file, we add, add theme support post thumbnails. Once we do that, the uh, featured image box magically appears and we can start to use it. It's awesome. But we can also do more in there. For example, we can set custom post thumbnail sizes, or we can even create new custom post thumbnails. 
So we can create a banner image that is a particular size. I want it to be 1280 by 600 images. And you see that little true? There's a true or false. The true says I want it to crop it automatically. So for example, if somebody gave me an image that was 1200 pixels by 1000 pixels wide or tall, it would just cut off 200 pixels from the top and 200 pixels from the bottom so that it was 600 pixels in the middle, which is great. And there's a plugin which you should know about. I should have mentioned it, but right down here, it's called Post Thumbnail Editor that will actually allow you to go in. And after WordPress automatically generates all those post thumbnails, you can then go in and recrop it if you want, which is super, super cool. So to use the featured images, not too difficult. We have the post thumbnail. That's all we need. Now we can modify that. We can say, if it has the post thumbnail, use it. If it doesn't, don't output anything. And then we can also get a particular size that we've created in our theme as well, which is awesome. This way you can have a background image that's large, a featured image that's small. Um, you can have maybe on the home page, you have a banner image which is using the exact same featured image, but just a different size of it. So WordPress will create 10 different sizes for you for every image if you ask it to, which is in incredible. You just want to make sure that you create the, um, the uh, sizes before you input your images. Because if you haven't created the sizes before you upload your images, it doesn't know to create the different sizes. You can generate them after the fact, but here's another bit of code. This one says, if it has a post thumbnail, show it. If not, show a placeholder image because you wouldn't want to have a design that's dependent upon a nice image and then not upload one. You want something that's a fallback so that if that image doesn't exist, you'd, you at least have something there that looks nice. And then here's a short way of doing that as well. Now that's a lot of code. But the beauty is you can find that code online a hundred different places. You just have to know to look for it. Plus you'll have it in this presentation afterwards. The next thing you have is the loop. Now some of you said you know the loop, which means some of you don't know the loop. But the loop is one of the foundation things about WordPress. You guys know that it's primarily, or at least it was primarily a blogging tool, right? And so blogs are meant you create a blog, and then you create another blog, and then you create another blog. So all of a sudden you have three or four or five or a hundred blogs. And you have to be able to find all of them. So you have to do what's called a loop, which says, I want to find all of the posts that are blogs, or all of the posts that are news, and I want to show all of them. And for each one, I'd like to show the featured image and the title and an excerpt of the text and then have a link to the permalink of that particular blog post. And so WordPress looks at the database and it says, oh, this is easy. I found all the stuff that matches this criteria of news items, and let me output them all for you. So I use posts for everything. This one is for recent news. This one are for the people that work at this particular business. These are the people that work there. So your basic loop without anything else, is this. If have post, while have post, get the post, and then you echo the content of that post, and then you say end while, and that is while you have the post, and end if, because you had a beginning if statement. You'll find this code everywhere online that you look for how to do the loop. You probably won't find it this simplified. You'll find it with all the fancy bells and whistles in there. Once you have run a loop, then what you have to do is say, I need to stop that data because I'd like to run something else now. And so you need to reset the loop or reset the query or reset the post data, something. The one that most people use, I think, is reset post data. So here's um, two ways that you might look at the post, get post and WP query, because we need to now sort our posts so we get the types of posts that we want. Because we just can't just do a general if have post, get the post. Because I want to know if I'll have news items or people that I'm looking for. So we have get post and WP query to do this. So the first one, get posts, 
says, I want to look for post for page two, the category name will be news. And what it does is it just finds the news items that I want, and it only does two posts per page, um, and then it allows me to do my loop with just that information, what's called a filter. Now this one has a for each loop in here. I'm not going to talk about the difference between for each and the next one, which is while, because they're essentially the same thing. I just wanted to show an example of what you'd see. This one is using WP Query, and it says, let's do a WP Query using category name news post per page. It's exactly the same thing. The only difference is that I'm using a WP Query here, and the other one I'm using get posts, which are two different hooks in WordPress. Which one do you use? Honestly, it doesn't really matter. However, the one that you see most people talking about is WP Query because it seems to be the most popular as well as the most powerful of the different types of ways to filter posts. Now you can also generate all these things automatically once again using that generate WP. If you want to be able to uh, use posts or pages or types or taxonomies or authors or I want to find all the posts that are written by a particular author, then you can use this to write the code for you. You don't have to write that complicated query yourself. It's actually pretty easy when you use this. Now, <clears throat> we can't get into posts too far without talking about custom posts and taxonomies because this is one of the other things that makes WordPress so cool. And until they put all these features in here, you know, it, it was still just a blogging tool. Now we have this powerful information organizing database that it can do. And so Nick was talking about this earlier today, right? About you use custom posts in everything, right? Laurel does it. Laurel, Laurel uses them. You designed it. But Laurel uses custom posts in pretty much all websites that they create because that's, what con that's the way clients think. They think about their content. They think about their menu. And they say, we have a menu, and we have appetizers, and then we have main dishes, and then we have desserts. And so they can match the way that the, orga the organization of the website and WordPress is organized to match the hierarchy of information that that client has. So for example, with this one, they have locations, people, knowledge base, and portfolio that they need to have in here. So I can create a post type in my functions that says I want to register a post type called people, and I want to call all of them persons, and I want to have a singular one called person. So now when I go back to, my, uh, to use it, I can say, I want to find a post type called people and just output all those people. That way I can customize my loop to just use that custom post type. And the only difference is adding post type equals people instead of, uh, what was that, post category or category name equals something. You guessed it, Generate WP allows you to create these custom post types. Now it can get a little complicated when you look at the code, so I even suggest using a plugin for this. A custom post type UI is really, really quite good. Um, I've used it a number of different times, and it simplifies this process. Here's what it might look like being used. This is a client of mine, and they have projects, and here you can see all of their different projects so that they can see the information they, the way I need them to see it. For example, they can see what the title of the project is, the featured image of the project, what date they added it, the, the type of project, who the architect was, where the location is. That way it's very easy for them to look at it and understand what that information is. Instead of me using WordPress just out of the box or using some sort of uh, commercial theme that I have to brute force make work the way I want it to. This way I customize the information for their needs, which makes it a lot easier for them to be able to edit the website, and a lot easier for me to be able to, to get it designed the way I want it to be. So one of the ways that I do this is custom fields. 
And it's with custom post types and custom fields that I think the biggest magic happens. Custom fields is actually at the bottom of every page and post that you go to. You might not have even noticed it was there. But you can create custom, and I'm sorry these are a little bit uh, light here, but you can create a custom field like custom image, sample JPEG, ipsum URL, ipsum.com, and the, the associated, associated presentation ID. I was looking at using a uh, HTML5 presentation tool, and so it generated that custom uh, field for me. Now, the problem with custom fields is that it's just text. And sometimes you need to be able to show the client, no, I need to fill in this text. I need to fill in the first name, the last name, the location, their email address, their phone number, um, what title you want to call them, what their, what their main image is going to be, what their qualifications are, all sorts of information. So I'm actually going to skip forward just a little bit because Nick and Laurel were talking about this earlier, which is called Advanced Custom Fields. Best plugin in the world. It is absolutely amazing what it does because it allows you to create a, an extremely powerful way to create custom fields for your clients on a page. So here's the way it might look. Here's where you go in to edit one of those projects I was talking about earlier. They have the project uh, title, the project type, locations, project description, and it keeps on going down the page, and they fill in all the little blocks of information. And it even has the featured image. Now, in order to use those, what you want to do is get the post metadata. That's what it's called. This get post meta is one of those other WordPress hooks. And then I'm adding the argument where I say I want it to get the message. Well, this is kind of funky code. I don't like that code. So I've often created a, um, or use a simple function to be able to simplify that so that all I have to do is say, um, get the custom field message. It's just a lot easier than get the ID and all that kind of stuff. But it's a simple code to put in there. Now, if you are using the ACF, the advanced custom fields, it makes it even easier because it says get field message. And that's it. It's extremely simple to use custom fields, but it's an, an incredibly powerful. And to me, with custom post types and custom fields, you can pretty much create just about any database structure for any client you would ever need. It's amazing what it can do. Another building block are short codes. Anybody use short codes? What do you think of them? They're awesome, but are they also a pain? Yeah. Have you ever given them to a client? Yeah, you know. And what does the client do? <laughs> the client goes, ah, because it looks like code to them. So even though short codes exist, I kind of avoid them. There are short codes are already kind of built into WordPress for like some of the, the uh, typical things like embedding a YouTube video or a blip TV video or um, Ustream. A lot of them are, are embed type things. But you can create your own. There are two basic types. There's enclosing and self-closing. Enclosing means you have a tag at the beginning and you have a tag at the end. Self-closing means that you have one tag and then it, you just have the argument inside and then you close it with the bracket at the end. Now, in order to use a short code or create your own short codes, it's actually pretty simple in your functions file. Here you say, I want to create a bold text short code, and I'm going to return strong and then whatever content and strong. Then, when I want to use it, all I have to do is put the little B in brackets in WordPress. Pretty cool. Can scare clients like you wouldn't believe. And I promise you, if you rely upon short code, then you will probably find that they will mess up the site, like menus. Menus are really, really hard to do in short codes. I, I used to use another system that has a very similar um, short code type thing. I would actually put it in, a, in an editor that would be embedded into the page that the client couldn't even see. Because if they saw all these like code-ish type things, 
they'd get confused. And uh, they want to see just content. And that's why custom fields does that. It shows them just content, no other programming stuff. So if you want to generate short codes with generate WP, it's there as well. So doing it yourself, does this sound like it's going to be impossible? No, it really isn't. We haven't gone over all the different tags, but who cares? You'll learn those tags as you get to them. What you have to have is a plan of attack and a method of working that allows you to minimize confusion. So you got to know some HTML, CSS. You have to know just a little bit of PHP, just a little bit, just to be able to recognize what's going on. And you have to learn how WordPress works, which we've talked about today. What are posts? What is the loop? What are short codes? If you don't know what those building blocks are, you don't know how to put them in there, how to put them into your theme. Then you have to go through the codex of WordPress. And you want to find all those little functions that you think you might want. You can search online, of course. But copy in only one tag at a time, just one at a time, even into a blank page, just to see what it outputs. Try not to go out and find all the other resources out there and just copy a mess of code. You can go to something like this, a cheat sheet, which shows you all the individual little pieces without much other information. Or you can go find all the snippets that are out there. The problem is with snippets is that you'll often feel like this. You'll be trying to find a snippet to do a particular thing, and you'll find a snippet that does that one particular thing and 12 other things. And it might not be what you want. And that's why when you're testing things out, go and copy in one at a time. That's it. Then get yourself some sort of editor. I don't know if you guys know brackets, but it's really quite good. I'm just using it nowadays because eh, it's kind of fun. It's a really powerful one, but it also has a great little feature, which is whoop. If I can get out of this thing. It has the ability for me to add snippets. Oh, of course, this thing is. There we go. For example, this is a great feature right here. Snippets Manager, and if you're using um, Dreamweaver or Sublime, all of them have this kind of feature if you want to look for it. But if I want to be able to add a certain piece of code, I can actually add it just like that because it understands it. Then you can create snippets of code that you know what they are. For example, WP dash, what is this? Template directory or wp-loop. And I can create these little pieces of code, these snippets of code that I understand, and then you can just use your library of code to inject the little template tags that you need instead of relying upon going to snippets online and trying to find every single time you do it um, the new code that you need. How many people have done it that way? Come on. We've all done it, where you go straight to the web instead of using code that you've done before and you understand. By building a little library of snippets and having them at your fingertips at any moment, I promise you, you will speed up your development time and you'll be able to add in new features as you go forward by developing fancier features. Now, if you need more on WordPress, about how to create themes and you want to walk through. I have a whole series on YouTube. There's 14 files um, or 14 videos. And then I also have here, which are the, the link to the files um, that are online as well. And I'm going to share this, this presentation with you um, right here at the end. So you can watch the videos and you have access to all the files with all the code in there that you could ever want that walks you through. Everything, including child themes, which I put on the description, which I didn't get to today. Because I went, oh, I don't think we're going to get to that. I think this is probably enough. So this is the link to the PDF um, that this presentation has. And if you have any questions, now is the time to ask. Any questions? How yeah.
Well, what I love about this thing, again, brackets, is that this particular database actually creates it for me right here. So all these little yellow tags are ones that I've created myself. And if you want to know the truth, I don't always practice what I preach because I have my snippets somewhere. I usually use themes I've created before, and I beg and borrow and steal from themes. And I've created a... Um, they were talking about Twitter bootstrap earlier today. I'm a foundation person. I just like it. And uh, so I've created like a starter theme in foundation that I install first and then I modify from there. Um, but I certainly, after starting to play with this, I'm like, man, I really need to make these snippets so that I can speed up my development without having to always go back to that theme. And uh, it's just a matter of trying things out, finding the things that work for you. And if you looked at some of my first themes, there's like three files in the entire theme. I mean, they're not, I mean, some of the websites that we create for smaller clients are really simple websites, but they're simple and elegant, not simple and, and basic. And, and, but it doesn't take that much code in WordPress to create a fully functioning and very effective website. So that's something I want you to leave with for sure, is that you don't have to have frameworks, the complexity of frameworks, to be able to have a very effective website. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Please. Sure thing. It is O4DNVM. C. Um, and that's tiny URL forward slash. Once again, that's O numeral four D N V M C. And those are all lowercase. And so when you go that go to that, basically it just loads up um, a box PDF, and then you can go and grab all the different code that I've talked about today. All right. Go out and make themes. Go out and make your own custom themes. I promise you. I promise you it's very rewarding when you get it done and you will find that you will never go back to commercial themes afterwards because you have so much more flexibility in what you can create when it comes to creating something for your clients that fits their mental model of their content that it, there's no turning back. Well, if you use something like Foundation, um, there's, it's easy. Foundation does it for you. Now, this is CSS. You've got to understand that the content is not responsive. Or let's say that responsiveness is about design, not about content. And what we're really talking about is structure and content today, not really about design. Uh, frameworks like Foundation and Twitter Bootstrap help you make responsive designs, which are absolutely wonderful. I can't tell you enough good things about Foundation since I started using it. I, dealt, I developed my own framework. I'm like, why did I do that? After I learned Foundation really well. I'm like, man, this is so much easier. And it's, and it's great. It makes beautiful websites. Or it can help you make beautiful websites. Yes, sir. Once you start building your own themes, <coughs> deprecated functions, how much you have to do? Honestly, there aren't that many. And that's the thing. If you stick to the basics, you won't have too many problems. I have websites that are six, seven years old, and they haven't had a single problem. Where they have problems are with plugins. Frameworks and plugins do not gel well together when they update from WordPress 3 to 4 and the plugins you know, two years old, and that's when all bets are off. And that's when websites need to be redesigned. But since I started doing my own custom ones and using functions for post types instead of plugins and stuff, I don't think I've ever had one ever crash. So the only thing that ever has been a problem has been links to a, a CDN. So, any other questions? If not, I think we are at the end.
So thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. Also, remember that all of these will be on our um, site afterwards. So if you ever do see a slide that you'd like to read it, you can go later and pull that up. So feel comfortable.